All right, so we'll roll. Um, good morning. Uh, not my normal day for doing this. We've been doing a lot of Sunday classes, but uh, we decided we'd squeeze one more in by putting it midweek, and it's usually been a pretty good time to put them in. I'm um, going to ask everybody to go on mute, and if you have relevant questions to, that are immediate to the slide we're on, you can type it in chat and I'll respond, but there'll be also a chance to ask questions at the end. Today we are talking about putting the garden to bed. So kind of a broad topic, we're gonna to go over an overview of the typical chores and tasks in the lawn, the garden or, and orchard, and also the landscape uh, for the fall season to give you some idea on what you're looking for because the season doesn't really end, you know, uh, in, in Western Oregon. It's kind of an ongoing process of, uh, of gardening through the year. So when we talk about fall in Western Oregon, and thankfully we're feeling almost fall-like now with our cool mornings and the chance of some rain coming in the next few days and long awaited, we're way overdue for some. But the fall is a time in the Pacific Northwest of both endings and also beginnings. Uh, a lot of growth is slowing, plants are going dormant. You actually see the beginning of the fall cycle happening as early as late August with some fall color trees actually beginning to turn a dramatic decrease increase in growth rate on most plants. Um, also, we're harvesting out the end of the vegetable garden and fall, of course, is the peak harvest for a lot of our, of our orchard crops, uh, apples and pears and even prunes and such. So those are kind of some endings that are happening now. But it's also uh, a season of beginnings. So with a Mediterranean climate pattern like we have here, um, the fall rains come in and after three or four months uh, or sometimes more of very dry weather, this initiates the growth for plants that are cool tolerant but need the moisture, things that go that do the process we call etanation, um, going summer dormant rather than hibernation, going winter dormant. Um, lawn is of course, lawn and turf is of course the biggest single item in that category as if you are not watering your lawn heavily over the summer, it is brown and it starts growing in the fall. It's the beginning, so we can say fall is spring for your turf. It's also a time of beginnings in the sense that it's an excellent time to do a lot of planting. Uh, perennials, bulbs, trees, some uh, very few vegetable crops and cover crops are all being actively planted in the fall. Fall is an excellent time for planting because of the low stress and the long season for plants to get acclimated before the, the heat and drought stress that occurs again later in the summer. So we're gonna kind of go through the broad categories and talk about what's going on. I'm gonna start off with lawns. And if anybody really wants a fully detailed lawn in the fall class, that is coming up on Sunday and then feel free to tune in for that one as well. Uh, but we'll give you kind of an overview today. So. The beginning of the fall wet and cool cycle really, really pushes a lot of new growth on turf. Um, and so unless you've been irrigating and feeding consistently, your, your lawn goes pretty well dormant in the summer, uh, but resumes growth as the rains begin. And we're even with just the humidity and the dew, we're actually beginning to see some, some response on, on unirrigated lawn right now, things beginning to transition. So it's really important that we encourage this new growth to come out as healthy as possible. Um, this things you're, step, you're doing now in the lawn will make a big difference even through next summer. And one of the first things we look at is um, uh, putting a good mowing on. As the new growth starts, you'll find that there's a lot of kind of rough turf, especially if you're not mowing short in the, in the late spring and early summer, a lot of kind of coarse turf that maybe is stringy, maybe has some disease or some sun and drought burn issues. And it's a really good idea to mow that back a bit harder than normal. So what we normally suggest in a turf situation is that, first of all, everybody over scalps their lawn. If you can, through the growing season, keep that lawn more like three to four inches long, your turf will be happier and healthier. But for this one time in the fall, when we're getting ready to have a big push of new growth, it's a good idea to mow that substantially shorter, one and a half to two inches above the, above the soil level. And this will encourage a, a more vigorous response and get rid of some of the old, tired, and in some cases, diseased uh, lawn ends. Um, this is also a good time to do dethatching and aerating. Um, dethatching is a process of tearing out the thatch layer, the stemmy layer that occurs between the roots, cr root crowns and the top growth. It's usually a kind of a brown 
uh, layer. Um, Dethatching will also tear up some weeds and even scarify the soil surface to allow some nutrient penetration and aeration to happen. Uh, but it does tear up the lawn pretty substantially. It leaves a lot of areas where the weaker grass gets actually raked out in the course of dethatching. Aerating is actually taking cores of soil out, taking plugs out. And so um, we're actually, again, promoting uh, water and nutrient penetration and air, and air penetration down into the lower uh, zones of the soil. And after you run an aerator and you run over it, um, you pulls out these plugs of soil. You'll need to rake out those plugs of soil and kind of fill in those gaps. Both dethatching and aerating tear up the turf pretty substantially. Um, and it's very common that after you do that, you'll want to put some patch seeding on. We'll talk about that in, in the next slide down. Um, it's important to remember in the fall to take the spent leaves off the, that fall off the trees and the larger shrubs that are coating the grass and get them raked off of the lawn. Um, you can compost them, you can add them into shrub or flower beds or even vegetable garden beds as a mulch layer, but don't leave them sit on the lawn. A very thin layer of leaves is not a problem. It will decompose fast enough, the grass will grow right through it. It's when we start accumulating more than an inch of leaves where you start needing to consider getting those leaves off the turf because they will actually create dead patches where the turf doesn't come back. So very small amounts of leaves can let lay Larger amounts should come off. When you're in a situation where leaves need to come off, don't let them sit for weeks and weeks before cutting it coming off because they will create dead patches. The lawn is beginning to actively grow. It is time to apply uh, needed nutrients. And there's two steps to that. Lime. So calcium lime or dolomitic lime both work well for this situation. The goal to liming is twofold. Lime corrects soil pH. Grass grows best in neutral to slightly alkaline conditions, and a lot of our weeds uh, and mosses grow best in acid conditions. So if we can correct the soil pH, uh, we will have healthier grass and less vigorous weeds and, and moss problems. The other factor to, uh, to liming is nutrient availability, and it's related to the pH, but it's somewhat different from. Uh, applying uh, lime will actually free up nutrients that are trapped in the soil, and it will also make the fertilizer you're actively putting down work more efficiently. It makes the grass absorb it better. When we're fertilizing in the fall on the lawn, it is very important to use a slow release long lasting fertilizer. We're not gonna want to push a lot of really fast growth because who wants to mow in the rain all winter long? What we want is enough fertilizer for good turf health and that, uh, that will release over a long sustained period. Um, organic fertilizers do that naturally, organic lawn fertilizers. Um, synthetic lawn fertilizers come in fall and winter formulations specifically designed to apply now. A single application is not likely to last the entire winter. If we put a fertilizer, a, a fall and winter fertilizer on now, we'll also need to probably reapply right around Christmas time to get us through the rest of the, of the cold season before we have more active mowing and active growth in the spring. Um, planting. So with the uh, beginnings of fall rain, grass seed germinates even without irrigation. Uh, which is you can certainly plant grass through the summer if you can provide enough water, but fall you can let the rain take care of that watering need for you, at least to a large extent. There are some limits to that. Um, the limits are mostly temperature, soil temperature related. So yes, we want to wait until we have some rain coming in to apply grass seed, but we may not be able to wait all the way till we have consistent rains because um, the soil temperature is declining. It's not only about air temperature, it's also about sun angle. And as that soil temperature declines, the time it takes for grass seed to germinate gets longer and longer and longer. At a certain level, um, you have this point of diminishing returns where that slow germination and increased moisture actually cause the seed to rot rather than sprout efficiently. Usually in Western Oregon, that, that line of demarcation is usually right around mid-October. So you wanna make sure if you're doing grass seeding, you, you get that well done by, by mid-October. And 
don't mistake me. You can put grass seed out in January and you will get some grass seed. It's about efficiency of product. Uh, if, you, if you're seeding in December or January, you're only gonna get a small percentage of the seed germinate. If you seed by mid-October, you'll have a very high percentage germinate and you can do so efficiently. Um, so thin areas, um, bare patches will need to be reseeded. Um, also a great time to start a new lawn, whether you're doing it from seed or, or whether you're doing it from, uh, from rolled out sod turf. Um, we'll get some more details in that in the fall lawn class, um, but it is, it's a good time to be doing that and uh, we can spend a whole class on that if we really wanted to. It's important to note that there are other maintenance uh, tasks in the lawn that we're gonna be covering in the next slide. And some of them will interfere with your ability to reseed. So sometimes it's making a priority decision about what is most, 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 uh, most important at the moment. So some maintenance tasks, some problems we might be addressing. Um, these are some typical fall and winter problems. And uh, one of the first ones is of course weeds. So of course we have weeds growing through the turf year round. And we have one group, so, so several groups of weeds that are definitely summer growing, especially in irrigated turf. But there's like, like with the turf itself, there's a whole batch of weeds that start germinating actively uh, as our cool weather develops and we get some more moisture in. So you're gonna have to control existing weeds um, as they're occurring and also newly sprouting weeds. Existing weeds can be controlled by hand removal when they're not too bad, uh, physical dig out, um, or they can be controlled with herbicides. But you may not be able to use the same herbicides you're used to using in June and July in the cooler seasons in October, September and October, because different herbicides work with different efficiencies at different temperatures. So if you're using an herbicide to actively control broadleaf weeds in, in a turf situation, you need to get one that is designed for cool season uh, use. Um, these will be defined by herbicides that usually have products like carfentrazone in them, or possibly um, higher ester formulations of more traditional herbicides uh, instead of the, 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 slow, the slower amine formulations. Um, Herbicides, um, con con direct sprayed herbicides for control of existing weeds will interfere with seeding for a period of a couple of weeks. So you normally will deal with the weeds first and then come through in about three weeks and do any seeding that needs to happen. Um, but we can also prevent weeds from sprouting. So a lot of them are actively starting to sprout now, will sprout over the winter and into early spring. And a valuable strategy is to use pre-emergent herbicides, granular usually herbicides that you put down that stop the seed from germinating. Uh, this is particularly effective for control of things like crabgrass that are very difficult to control with spray herbicides. The drawback to using pre-emergence is your newly seeded lawn or patch seeded lawn, you can't apply these pre-emergence for several weeks after seeding. It's usually four to six weeks after seeding. On the other hand, if you put the pre-emergent down first, you pretty much are re eliminating your chance of doing any additional reseeding for this entire season. It's several months of residual control. So if you are gonna be using pre-emergence, you need to, to have as much patching uh, as you're gonna do done, as much seeding as you're gonna do done and still have, uh, have time to get that pre-emergent out. This is not a disaster, even if you're getting some weeds up. Uh, if you get focus on getting that seeding done, and then have that interval, that roughly four week interval, and then put down your pre-emergent, you're still going to control at least some of the weeds that you would have otherwise had over the winter. But make sure you're well aware of those intervals. Different pre-emergents have different intervals, so read the labels carefully to make sure you understand. Moss control is kind of a similar situation. If you have a lot of active moss, you're gonna to need to get rid of the moss before you seed because it's gonna inhibit good development. Um, the products we use to control existing moss are primarily iron containing, fairly high concentrations of anhydrous uh, iron sulfate. And they do a really good job of, of killing moss without killing uh, the grass, but they also inhibit seed germination and root development a little bit. 
So you can't go through and do a quick moss kill and then come back in a few days and reseed. You need to have that moss control product out on, on the ground. Um, then you need to take the time to actually rake out the dead and dying moss. And we will often do this in conjunction with like a dethatching. So put a moss control out and then dethatch. And then about three weeks after you can safely seed. Um, you can reduce the reincidence of moss by liming, as we discussed a moment ago, uh, because good liming and good fertilization practices reduce moss development. Mowing higher through the summer, setting your mower to the highest possible setting, getting a, around three inches or more of, of grass up, uh, is definitely beneficial in terms of reducing moss. It also reduces weeds to some extent. A uh, question on the on the chat: Should we apply lime and fertilizer before or after seeding? Generally speaking, we will lime and fertilize either at the same time we're seeding or shortly before seeding. Um, if you're using synthetic fertilizers, generally speaking, I would like you to have a little interval between the application of the fertilizer and then seeding, um, just a couple of weeks, or use a lighter than recommended dose. If you're using the organic fertilizers, you can do them literally same day. So um, unless you're using a starter fertilizer specifically designed, like you're starting a brand new lawn specifically designed for starting a lawn, you can do that the same time you seed, and those are, those are synthetic. You can do uh, organic fertilizer the same time you receive them. Usually same day, lime, then fertilize, then seed in that order. Um, if you're using a traditional fall and winter, use it about half strength if you are planning on seeding right away within the next day or two. Um, one of the things about moss that I want to bring up is the consideration of the bigger picture. You can make grass grow in almost any situation briefly. Getting grass to be effective and healthy over the long term means that there are sites that work well and there are sites that don't. If you have a site that you are chronically fighting moss problems in, you may be in a situation that is really not best suited to lawn. Uh, really dense shade, high acidic environments, environments that are in the shadow pattern of buildings over the winter, like where, you're, where your two-story house shades out a section of the, of the turf. You're going to fight that and fight that and fight that. Yes, you can have good summer turf out there if you work at it, but you may have to redo it literally every year in those situations. So if you're seeing a lot of moss problems, a lot of bare spots, consider if this problem may be the site and you may, may be better served to, to use a different plant than, than turf for that area. Um, a lot of bug problems can occur in turf. Most of them are fairly minor here. Crane fly is not. Um, the European crane fly is a, quite a disaster of a pest. Um, they lay, they're high density, high population density pests. They lay lots of eggs. Those eggs hatch in the summer to fall. Those larvae spend the entire fall and winter eating the roots out of the grass. And then suddenly in the spring, you have what you see in, in that top picture there, a literally bare patches where all the grass is dead because all the roots are gone. Um, so, they're difficult insect to control, not only because of the sheer volume of pests and the damage they can do, but because they, their behavior is stretched out over a long season. The, uh, the grubs mature into their adult stage in the late spring, mid to late spring. Those adults are out flying, mating, and begin egg laying as early as maybe late May, but will lay eggs over quite a staggered period of the, of the summer. Then those eggs, laid at different times, hatch at different times over a very long period of summer to fall. So putting a one time through liquid insecticide or a really quick releasing granular insecticide does a pretty good job of killing some, but to get really good control of crane fly, you need an insecticide that will release over a very long period of time. So you catch multiple generations, multiple hatches of this, uh, the pest. So typically this means using granular uh, insecticides with a systemic component. Um, um, there's, a, there's a number of brands of grub control and, and, and specifically designed for that. Um, you want to make sure you're getting a product that has at least an eight week residual and preferably a three to four month residual um, because the hatch period is that long. 
by the time you hit spring and you see this kind of damage like you see in the picture there, um, there's not that many crane flies left. You can follow up with a quick insecticide to make sure you've got what is remaining under control. But really, the time to treat crane fly is not in the spring. It is now. It's August, September. Get a long-lasting granular insecticide. Now, strategies for crane fly control besides just killing. First of all, a crane fly tends to lay and have most success rate in soils that are relatively damp. So improving drainage often substantially reduces crane fly populations. Secondly, um, if you can, again, keep your turf higher in the summer, um, their ovipositor is only so long and they don't necessarily crawl through the grass down to soil to lay eggs. They tend to kind of spread them willy-nilly across the, across the grass stems. So if you can have a little bit longer turf, fewer of those eggs make it down to soil surface and develop normally. And that will reduce your crane fly population. The combination of good drainage, proper fertilization, and, and, and decent mowing can go a long way to eliminating crane fly problems. Um, they may not be the 100% cure, but um, you can really reduce your dependence on insecticides by taking those steps. Diseases are more complicated. Turf is subject to a variety of diseases, a very large variety of diseases, like most monoculture plantings are that are high density. Um, there are diseases that are more active in the hot season and dry season. There are diseases that are more active in the cooler and wet season. And the thing I want to tell you about diseases is simply, you can't necessarily go at yourself or just assume that there is one blanket treatment or one blanket uh, uh, technique for eliminating lawn diseases. Diagnosis is incredibly important. Um, figuring out what disease problem you have, uh, or at least narrowing down the possibilities, can go a long way to reducing or eliminating the problem. The vast majority of turf diseases that we see coming in in samples to the nurseries can be controlled uh, by proper mowing, feeding, and watering. Um, very few of them require product application, and in many cases, uh, product application does no good or can even do some harm. That being said, a few of the more vigorous diseases um, can be controlled with specific fungicides, but we have to know exactly which disease to get which fungicide. And even in cultural treatment, it's not as simple as saying feed more. Some diseases are more prevalent on grass that is growing really rapidly in cool season. Other diseases are more prevalent on turf that is stressed due to nutrient deficiencies. So really critical to figure out which problem you're having so we can tell you how to feed water and or apply a fungicide to make sure it's well managed. Um, and it's, it's, it's a complicated topic. Uh, tur turf diseases are somewhat complex. On to the main landscaping uh, areas. So in the landscape, we're talking about trees and shrubs, flowers and perennials. The vast majority of things are going dormant. Uh, they started going dormant in August. We'll see that um, diseases, disease prone plants like azaleas, for example, get powdery mildew pretty, re pretty readily in this season because they are going dormant, because they're no longer able to fight off the small amounts of disease pressure that they're experiencing. Um, and it's not uh, something we would consider to be a disaster. It's worth, uh, if you're seeing disease symptoms on a particular on deciduous plants, maybe bring some samples to the nursery, make sure we you know, know what exactly what you're seeing and, and how big of a problem it's likely to be next year. But in many cases, we don't actively treat mild fungal diseases that happen in the late summer to fall because they're just not gonna be really relevant. The plant can't fight them off no matter what you do. Um, deciduous plants lose leaves. Uh, sometimes a fair amount of leaves accumulate. Make sure you get those off of turf areas um, or off the tops of, of plants that are going to be growing over the winter. For example, evergreen ground covers or uh, even smaller conifers. Um, don't let the leaves sit on there for long periods of time, choking out the plant, causing uh, problems. What to do with those leaves is uh, somewhat subject to your individual tastes. Um, you can use them as mulch directly. If you're using them as mulch directly, you want to put pretty solid layers. So this would be in um, flower beds, annual flower beds after the flowers are gone, in vegetable garden areas that are not being cover cropped or, or winter cropped. Um, you can actually accumulate the leaves, pile them in three or four inches deep, and then smash them down or crush them down, compact them so they don't just blow everywhere at the first little breeze. 
Um, this crushing will also speed up the decomposition process so you don't have a whole batch of dead dry leaves still sitting on the ground uh, in, the, in the spring when you're ready to plant. It's important if you are using leaf compost or leaf mulch in, uh, in annual beds, whether that's vegetable or flower, that you don't in the spring rake away the remaining residues and do something else with them because the microbes that are coming up out of the soil and breaking down their leaves are taking a lot of the soil nutrition with them, the, 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 the particular nitrogen in, in their bodies. Um, so if you then take up that last bit of, of dead leaf and the microbes that are in it and rake it off, you've stripped a lot of nutrients out of your soil. So any leaf residues that are left at the end of the end of the winter, incorporate in either hoe them in or till them in prior to planting. You can also use um, leaf mulches around woody shrubs and trees. Uh, it's a good idea to practice the donut method where you crush the leaves again um, in a fairly thick layer, but you leave airspace around the trunks of the shrubs and trees so that you're not compressing wet decomposing material up against the crown and lower trunk. Um, because this can lead to a, a quite a variety of disease problems or even suffocation problems. Uh, keep an keep a airspace around the, the trunks of woody plants. Fertilizing in the fall is a question we get a lot. Um, and new plantings that you're doing in the fall should definitely be fertilized, whether that's bulbs or trees or shrubs. Fertilizing heavily in the, in the fall is, is, is counterproductive. Plants are trying to go dormant. If we throw a lot of nitrogen at them, we will make them not go dormant, and then they will be subject to disease pressure or cold damage as the weather turns. Light feedings, gentle and slow release feedings, are very valuable for plants that can really make decent use of the nutrients this time of year. These are plants that are storing a lot of energy for next year's flower and fruit development, like fruit and flowering trees, for example. Lilacs would also fall into this category. Rhodes often suffer severe nutrient deficiencies over the winter. Um, it's just a really long period for not much coming in. Uh, a lot of other broadleaf evergreens may have this problem as well. Uh, so a light feeding of a slow release or organic fertilizer on plants that really can make use of that nutrient is good. Willy-nilly feeding all your shrubs because they're there in the fall is not beneficial. Perennials obviously mostly go dormant and don't need any fertilization in the fall either. This is a good time to um, examine as these plants are going dormant, uh, carefully for some pests that are persistent pests that are best controlled in the winter. Um, this particularly includes mites, uh, western spider mite, our dominant one here, mealybugs and scale insects. Also the new pest on rhodes and azaleas, the new lace bug, is a, it winters over. So determine if you're having any of these insect pest problems, consult a nursery professional if you need some assistance with that. And if you are seeing mealybug populations, mite populations, scale populations, lace bugs, there are specific treatments that can be applied during the dormant winter season that can dramatically reduce these pests. And it applies to both evergreen plants and deciduous plants. Some general fall maintenance things that will be going on in the landscape. Um, Perennials, uh, most, there are a few evergreen perennials. Most perennials are herbaceous. They will die back to the ground or to a, to a, a crown of stems. And those herbaceous perennials should be cut back after they brown down. There's no real rush on it. And if you think about it in the, in the, in the broader scale of things, you know, out in the wild where these plants originated, nobody goes through and cleans them up. But there are advantages to cleaning them up. Uh, we have relatively high density plantings in ornamental landscapes, so cleaning them up can reduce some of the disease and insect pressure that can accumulate in that uh, decaying material. Also, it's simply an aesthetic choice. Having a lot of large brown stems up in the air or laying on the ground simply isn't attractive. Um, different perennials will have different specific needs on pruning, so it's worth a little investigation uh, on a plant-by-plant -plant basis for what's in your yard. Generally, uh, a lot of fully herbaceous perennials can be cut down at soil level after they've completely browned. A few actually keep some degree of semi-woody or erect stems. Uh, a good example of this would be penstemons. Um, and you don't want to prune them all the way back to the ground or you're actually going to really slow down their, their re recovery in the spring. 
leaving small stub areas, an inch, inch and a half of, uh, of stem mass above ground is better than going all the way down. Uh, a few of the more vigorous plants um, or more woody plants like uh, need, need even more stem up. So be aware of the difference between stem tissue, crown tissue, and don't cut into crown tissue. A question in the chat, how much to prune lavender? So lavenders come in several flavors. Generally speaking, English lavenders are light pruned uh, on, the, on the surfaces uh, repeatedly through the year, not necessarily strictly in the fall. Um, you can cut into the live tissues, into, the, into the, the leafy tissues, but don't ever prune lavenders of any sort back really, really hard. What happens as lavenders age is the center crown and the woody stems out of the middle um, lose the ability to initiate new growth, just like heathers do. Um, so you have to prune lightly and frequently to control lavenders rather than letting them grow and grow and grow and then pruning them back hard in the fall. English are the most tolerant, French and particularly Spanish are much less tolerant of, of pruning. As with turf situations, weed control is relevant in the, in the ornamental landscape. And again, we have active control of weeds uh, and then pre-emergent control of weeds. Um, Broadleaf selective herbicides are much less frequently used in ornamental landscape in, in deference to less selective and more contact-based herbicides like, like glyphosate. Um, and glyphosate and even some of the vinegar and acetic acid type uh, uh, non-selective uh, herbicides do work in cooler temperatures. They are significantly slower acting and they don't work later into the season as some of the weeds go through a dormant phase too. If the weeds are browning down or changing substantial color, you may not get good control anymore. Most of them are, um, are foliar absorbed. Question in chat, Heather with heat damage. Uh, question is to prune or wait and see what happens. So the answer to that question is it depends. Heather is a big topic. We have winter heathers or heaths. We have Kalunas, the, the true or scotch heathers, um, and they're just finishing blooming. And in between the two, in the early summer, we have Debeshas, the Irish bell heathers, and all of them prune somewhat differently. Irish bell heather, whack away. Um, even if you prune them relatively hard, they will resurge pretty, pretty readily. Um, winter heathers, I normally would take a pause on pruning because they are in bud stage. If you have no flowers at all and, 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 a, and a lot of brown tips but some good tissue underneath, light pruning is acceptable. Kalunas we do normally prune right now as they finish blooming and what you'll see on Kalunas is you'll have the flowery part of the, of, the, of the stem tip where the flowers were. You might even have a little bit of new growth past the end of that flower spike. You want to prune back to the base of the flower spike but not very far into the, uh, into the old tissue. Um, and there's no major problem with doing some cleanup pruning now. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about pruning generically here in just a minute. Um, Pre-emergence are just like turf pre-emergence, sometimes some different products used. Um, again, if you are doing active planting, it is important you get your active planting done and then apply it pre-emergent. Unlike with grass, unless you are doing something by seed for some reason at this point in time, for example, native wildflowers, you can do the pre-emergent right after, immediately after you're, you're done planting. So with bulbs and with woody plants, um, you get the planting done, then you come over the top of it with a pre-emergent for weed suppression, and that's, that's a fine approach. I say that advisedly, not all pre-emergents are equal. Um, Casseron, you have to be extraordinarily careful with. Uh, preen, trifluralin, um, or dimension are much less picky as long as you've got the planting done. What you don't want to do is you don't want to get those herbicide granules down into the root zone by turning the soil and planting. Mulching, we talked about mulching as leaf mulch, but there's certainly other products you can use for mulch. Mulch is the uh, generic and organic way of pre-emergent control and simply burying the weed seed enough that they don't germinate. So mulching is not a bad idea at all in the fall. You get a little bit more mileage out of mulching in the spring because it works as a moisture conservation. Some people do some of both. The same basic rules apply for bark mulches and compost mulches as do for leaf mulches. Substantial layers are valuable. Um, 
be expecting that anything that is still decomposing, like wood chips or bark or dead leaves, are going to take a certain amount of nutrients out of the soil briefly while the microbes are spraying them down. If you let that process finish, the microbes die off, return those nutrients to the soil, that's great. What often happens with mulching is we mulch and then we mulch and then we mulch and we never really finish a decomposition cycle back down to a dirt level. And so we keep tying more and more nutrients up in biology and not available to the plants. So there's nothing inherently wrong with that and it can be very effective aesthetically as well as promoting some health in the plants. The key thing here is if you're going to take that approach of repeat mulching, make sure you put a layer of fertilizer down before you put the next layer of mulch down. So you are feeding that biology and also feeding the plants. So you're not stripping so much nutrient out of the soil. To prune or not to prune in the fall? Well, that's a loaded question. And one of the reasons it's a loaded question is people haven't always grown up in this area. And the answers are very different if you're in California or in the Midwest than they are here in the Willamette Valley. Pruning can be done to a limited extent in the, in the late summer and fall, but you have to be careful. We, what happens if you prune pretty hard in August and September is a lot of plants will respond by trying to grow some more. And that's not good. We, we want them to finish going dormant, even the evergreens. Um, it's always an appropriate process to go through and clean up wayward branches, dead, damaged, or diseased tissue. There's no harm, no foul to doing that in the fall. Um, other than that, pruning needs to either mostly wait until plants are completely dormant. And by completely dormant, we're talking about December here. You notice um, things like pear trees don't finish discoloring and dropping until November, December, same thing with roses a lot. We're not, things don't go crisply dormant like they do in colder climates. Um, so we can't count on an early pruning, just staying dormant until the new growth begins. Um, in many cases, you are ahead to wait until the new growth is just at the point of beginning February, March for most pruning. There are exceptions. Uh, the big exceptions are plants that tend to bleed heavily on the new growth if, if the cuts are fresh. Um, particularly of note there, um, magnolias have a tendency to bleed, walnuts bleed, maples, particularly Japanese maples bleed. I would like to see you do your pruning on those sensitive plants in the late summer, maybe as late as early fall, September. If you wait until late October, you're doing the same thing as dormant pruning and they're likely to have at least some bleed as the new growth pushes uh, the next spring. Um, so judicious pruning is okay, don't get carried away. Fall is one of the worst times to do large scale pruning on most plants. One of the big things about fall is fall is ideal for planting most hardy plants, the perennials, trees, shrubs, fruits, um, bulbs. Uh, it's really the only time to plant a lot of the bulbs that you see blooming in March and April. Um, selection is not always at its peak in the fall in the nurseries, it's simple economics, but for, for the things you can find available in the late summer to fall, fall is, is ideal planting weather. Plants have a large, long period of time to adapt to their new home before the drought. Um, they are dormant enough to go through much less stress in the course of transplanting. Uh, so excellent timing, and uh, you'll see that there's a lot of material available. As I mentioned, bulbs come on uh, now. We're, we're starting to get tulips and daffodils and, and those kind of bulbs in now. Excellent time to plant them. Uh, and your periods of planting for these plants mostly starts in October as, as we really cool down and, and, and the rains come in, but continues. Um, you have good planting weather except for a few days, literally all winter long, and we kind of slow down the plantings as we get it towards May, June as things start warming up and, and growing again. Um, so don't worry if you have to wait a little bit on your, on your planting. Um, we can winter plant here. We don't really freeze like that most years. There are always exceptions. In the case of bulbs, sooner is better within limits. You don't really want to throw the bulbs out there in super dry, hot conditions. Um, but if you're waiting till November or December, you may be skewing the bloom time or adding a little bit of stress. They are pretty, um, pretty keyed to start growing. And they'll sometimes even start growing out of the ground on the containers sitting on the counter ready to, ready to plant. So don't delay too much on bulbs. Most other things are pretty forgiving. 
there are some summer annuals that you can plant for fall and winter, or some fall, some annuals you can plant for fall and winter interest. Um, mums are the big one right now. Mums are beautiful and intense. Uh, mums have a relatively short bloom period and may not come back. We treat them more as an annual. If you're growing them in a container or a raised bed or a well burned site, you might be able to get mums to, uh, to successfully winter here. In most cases, they just don't do as well the second year. Asters, on the other hand, do exceptionally well as perennials planted from, from this time of year. Um, asters will start blooming just at the end of the, of the mum cycle, so usually in October, and will bloom for a slightly longer period of time than mums, and will consistently come back year after year with, with only moderate care. If you want your asters to consistently be fall asters rather than summer blooming asters, the next year you will need to do a couple of prunings in the, during the growing season to keep them more dense and compact, but also to delay the bud formation. Otherwise they'll bloom out tall and stringy and a bit earlier than you expect. Kale and cabbage are used as winter ornamentals. These are, uh, the varieties that are used are perfectly edible. Growers who are growing them as intentionally as ornamental may not be growing them in organic method or in a method you would like to use in terms of crops you're gonna eat. So I would not normally plant ornamental kale and cabbage in the vegetable garden as a, as a vegetable. Um, just because we never know exactly what they've done with them. Um, but they make really nice um, fall through winter annuals. And late winter, early spring, usually around February, they're going to start bolting. They're going to start elongating and trying to form a flower. And at that point in time, you need to get them out because they're going to rapidly flower, die, and rot. It is possible to get um, your ornamental cabbages enough damage in the winter, especially if they're a little on the young side, um, to do the same thing, to just simply uh, die out early. Generally speaking, they're they are hardy clear through the winter. Pansies are your real color spot through the winter. So pansies are technically a cool season annual. Um, they will tend to grow really well through the fall, winter, and spring. And they'll decline as the weather gets hot in the summer. They can perennialize in the sense of original parent plant coming back, especially in partly shaded environments. They can sometimes reseed and establish themselves as populations, particularly the smaller flowered violas. Um, but generally speaking, you grow them as a winter, uh, winter color. To maintain good winter color on pansies, you need to fertilize them. They're not going to take up nutrients from the soil well, so this means liquid feeding them give them a liquid nutrient source at least every couple of weeks through the winter to keep them rebudding and reblooming. Otherwise you'll go through their flower cycle and they'll kind of sit there and wait till spring develops. Garden and orchard, of course, this is harvest season. Uh, as anybody who is gardening or orcharding can well attest, they're overwhelmed with things to do and things to can and things to dry. Um, so a couple of things that are specifically relevant to that. Um, as the, in the vegetable garden in particular, what, what you're gonna see is you have a lot of crops that are still trying to develop. Um, repeat of blooming and developing crops like, uh, like peppers and, and tomatoes, or crops that are, take a long time to cycle out like melons. You need to start really paying attention to the weather now. This is your last chance to save some of these if, if, that are close to ripe, but maybe aren't quite there yet. You may need to put frost blankets over it, remade blankets. If we start cooling down too much at night, you may need to shelter your tomatoes from rain or they will split when they get rained on. Um, so pay attention to your weather forecast. Look at your garden, see what is so green, there's no chance. See what is almost ripe, but could be damaged by the weather and take, take steps accordingly to try to get as much of that produce saved as possible. Most of your uh, main fruit trees, as opposed to smaller fruit berries, um, are harvested in the fall as well. Um, we get plums uh, in September. Act ahead of normal this year, our, our prune plums are, are well out already. Um, apples and pears, later in the cycle, you'll get quinces, um, and eventually in the late fall to early winter, persimmons. Um, it's just a, an ongoing process of harvesting and preserving. So understand the crop, learn the ripening cues so you're picking them at the right stage, learn which ones can be early ripened and then storage, early harvested and then storage ripened like winter pears, um, and, and figure out how you're gonna preserve them or store them 
to make good use of them because the, the problem with tree fruits is you have too much all at once. Back to the vegetable garden for a moment, sweet potatoes. So most crops, we try to beat the weather and get out uh, as best we can. Um, there's a tendency to think of sweet potatoes as a very delicate crop, um, and it can be, but you will get the maximum yield out of your sweet potatoes by leaving them in the ground as late as humanly possible. So watch your weather again. When we're getting a little bit of light rain is a likely time to look into harvesting. We may not have enough rain out of this front that's coming in this weekend to matter because the plants are gonna continue growing. We're not quite dormant yet. If we were having an inch and a half of rain coming in three days in October, I'd say go dig. Um, so it's a balancing act. Um, you can let sweet potatoes stay out through maybe a light frost. What you wanna do is you wanna get your sweet potatoes out of the ground before they either take so much frost damage, you start getting damage on the tips of the tubers, or before we get so much rain, that we're concerned, concerned about softening and rotting the tubers. You need to get your sweet potatoes out of the ground and cured over, it takes about three weeks from digging to eating, uh, cured at warm temperatures. So in the orchard, we talk about getting the harvest out, but there's always stuff that doesn't harvest out for one reason or other, things that drop late, things that dropped too early and got damaged and we just let, left lay on the ground. It's very valuable to clean up those crop residues. Those, those crop residues, those, those spoiled fruit on the ground can be a host to a variety of disease and insect problems. Um, and getting them out of the ground is one of the biggest steps you can do to reduce your need for spraying next year. We don't want to get wholesale into orchard pruning at this stage in the game. This is a really a, a, a winter project for most pruning. But if you have visibly damaged or diseased branches, it's a fine time to do some cleanup pruning. Just don't get carried away with it. As with other types of, uh, of, of woody plant plantings, mulching is beneficial, uh, or even in some, in some cases, cover cropping in your orchard. Uh, can preserve um, soil quality and nutrient availability for next year. And the same rules apply for mulching in the orchard as they do for ornamentals. Nice thick layers of mulch and airspace around the trunks or crowns so you're not damaging plants. The other big thing for the orchard uh, in this season is to kind of evaluate where you've been this year in terms of insect and disease problems and make a plan for your dormant season. Uh, dormant season spraying, you could start many dormant sprays already on plants that have already passed crop, like uh, as the prune plums are finishing out uh, shortly. Um, summer crops like peaches, nectarines, cherries that are already gone. Um, this is the earliest you can start because our temperatures are finally cool enough we can get away with dormant season spraying. Generally speaking, we're gonna wait a little bit unless we have a compelling reason to, to, to really jump into, uh, like trying to get multiple, multiple, herbicide, uh, multiple fungicide sprays out. Um, there's no harm in waiting a bit, but if you need to get as many sprays on as possible because you're actively fighting disease problems, you could start this early. You don't wanna do those sprays while there's fruit on the tree, and we want to be careful when the temperatures are approaching 80 degrees, and those are kind of your cutoffs. But at least see where you're at, what kinds of problems you've had, and get your plan in place for what you're going to spray and how often over the dormant winter season. So in the garden, we have uh, both some chores and some opportunities. We are at kind of the end of our planting opportunities in the vegetable garden. It's not gone yet. We're just down to the last little bits of things. So we can still transplant, though not direct seed, um, winter and overwintering um, broc uh, cauliflower and cabbage, kale plants, leafy greens like spinach, even lettuce potentially, um, overwintering broccoli. We are at the very tail end of that season. So if you're gonna do that, you need to get on it immediately and you need to feed pretty heavily with, with again, water soluble fertilizers as the soil temperatures decline, granulars reduce their effectiveness uh, to make sure you get enough growth out for those plants to be healthy and productive um, because if we're, we're getting very late. Uh, we're just at the, at the crooks of beginning planting garlic, shallots, and onions from, from bulbs. 
And those are starting to roll in at the, at the nurseries literally any day now. We normally start planting in late September. It can be planted through the fall, even through the winter. But these are all day length regulated crops. So the sooner you get them in, the bigger your yields will be. You can theoretically plant garlic bulbs in March and still get garlic. You just won't get a lot of garlic. The other planting factor in the garden is cover cropping. Cover cropping to improve your soil quality and, and conserve or improve soil nutrient availability. So um, we did a cover crop class a couple of weeks ago. You can check it out on the YouTube channel if you'd like. But the, the broad scope is don't wait to put in cover crops. If you're growing things like tomatoes and winter squashes and such, um, you need to be aware that by the time your crops are done, your cover crops are not going to really develop very well. Any spot where you've got plants that are already gone, like my melons pretty much finished up and I've, I've pulled the vines, go ahead and get cover crop out there as soon as possible. August is great. Tomatoes and peppers, things are gonna be there as late as October. Uh, pole beans perhaps might hold on that late. Go ahead and get your cover crops planted right up against them as best you can. Seed right into them. Those cover crops are going to take some time to develop um, and you'll have less big bare spots that don't have any cover crop if you uh, if you tackle it as, as best you can early. Legume cover crops like clovers, vetches are relatively slow to develop. If you wait till October you're not going to get much. Grains have more cushion. They will germinate at cooler temperatures and they'll grow faster at cooler temperatures. Um, some combination of the two is often used as cover crops and um, getting them in as soon as possible is definitely advantageous. A uh, question, stepping back to the orchard for a minute, um, uh, on dormant spraying, asking, do we mean dormant oil? So dormant oil is used to control things like scale insects and aphids in the orchard uh, and is done in the winter and it could be done as early as now if you're having ongoing problems. It's also done sometimes on ornamentals for the same reason. Um, the big reason most people spray in the winter on orchard crops is for disease control. And that's usually either sulfur or copper products. Um, and these are significant preventives. They're not really very good active season treatments for diseases, but they do a pretty good job of preventing the, the reinfection. There's a lot of ins and outs of dormant spraying. We do do a dormant spraying class in the winter. It's worth attending. Um, the big thing here is to not neglect the concept of dormant spraying. Uh, it's sometimes the only way to get substantial control of things like peach leaf curl, uh, um, various spot diseases on cherries and apricots, to some extent uh, rust on pears and uh, quinces and sometimes apples, apple scab, some of the mildews. Dormant spraying may never completely eliminate all these problems, um, but it can substantially reduce them and make them manageable. So when you're seeing peach leaf curl in May, you only have some peach leaf curl and you can address it with active season uh, organic fungicides. If you don't do any dormant spraying, things like peach leaf curl or lilac bacterial blight on cherries can kill the trees. Uh, they can be that bad. So preventative, they're not the absolute cure-all, but they make a big step forward to managing disease problems. Uh, other chores in the garden, and one that often gets neglected by, by, especially by newer gardeners, crop rotations. It's a really good idea to either take some pictures or make some notes of what was planted where. You think you'll remember in May, but you might not, uh, especially if you, you follow irregular planting layouts like I do, uh, not, not planting everything in blocks and rows. So we want to make sure you don't plant the same plants or very closely related plants in the same soil season after season because you build up insect and disease problems. And that's the concept of crop rotation. So knowing that you had tomatoes in this corner of the raised bed this year, means you shouldn't plant potatoes or tomatoes or peppers or eggplant there next year. You should do something unrelated, a leaf crop or a legume uh, or a coal crop. Um, and you practice that crop rotation on an ongoing basis. It will, it will reduce a lot of very serious problems uh, in your vegetable gardening. Uh, think of the potato famine uh, in Ireland. You know, they planted potatoes in the same soil year after year after year and they got away with it for a while, 
And then when they didn't, it was a truly disaster level failure. The same thing can happen on a smaller scale in your vegetable garden. So practice good rot crop rotations. Another way to substantially reduce uh, disease and insect pressure is to make sure you're getting rid of all those fallen rot, half rotted tomatoes, the zucchini that got too large that you just cut and abandoned. Um, also the plants as they finish out. And my melon crop is done. I went and pulled all the vines. Um, most of these crop debris and dead plants can be composted yourself if you're using hot compost methods. You're getting, generating enough heat in your compost pile to sterilize. Um, but definitely don't leave them in the garden to be incorporated into the soil next year. Um, that will result in volunteer plants where you don't want them and potential pest and disease issues. There are winter crops, some of which we've been planting since July, others we might be planting now. Um, and there are cover crops, but there's always the spots in the garden where you had crops too late to get a good cover crop take, or for any number of reasons, you may not want to cover crop. And these are good candidates for mulching. We talked about using a leaf mulch and there's nothing wrong with that. You can also use compost mulches. Manure mulches are suitable or even, uh, even mint compost. The thing about using manure and mint products is, uh, is a timing thing. The advantage to using those products is not just the mulching, it's also the nutrients that are present. And to get good use of those, you want to make sure that you don't have all those nutrients released and dispersed and gone by the time you want to plant. So if you are manuring in the late summer or fall, or if you're putting mint compost on in the late summer or fall, you want fairly fresh product that's not substantially decomposed. It's gonna finish its decomposition cycle over the winter and those nutrients will be available for spring planting. On the other hand, if you do, do mulching or adding of manures or mint compost in the spring, it's very important that you use material that's already very well decomposed or you're gonna have allelopathy problems where the decomposition cycle interferes with the growth of new, new plants going in or simply too hot, too much nutrient available and actually burning the new plants going in. And a question again in chat, cover crops in asparagus. Yes, you should cover asparagus. You shouldn't cover crop asparagus. Asparagus is uh, not tolerant of competition and it's not a situation where you can incorporate a cover crop. Most cover crops are designed to be tilled in, but you should mulch your asparagus beds. And the easiest way to mulch your asparagus beds is to cut the tops as they yellow lay the tops right over the top of the of the bed and then you can put some uh, a fine layer of compost or a fine layer of leaf debris on top of that um, the 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 actual crowns of the of the asparagus are pretty deep you're not risking composting them by having even fairly fresh actively decomposing material on top because that's clear subsoil um, don't get more than three or four inches of material over the top, generally speaking. In colder climates, they'll sometimes take different approaches, but for the valley, that's, that's plenty fine. I usually just do the tops of mine and throw a little bit of either compost or, or leaf debris on, on top of that. Um, slugs. So slugs are active through the wet season. They've been active through the summer areas you're irrigating, but there's a lot of adult slugs laying eggs right now. And there's a lot of young slugs that will actually survive the winter feeding on plants and get bigger and ready to lay eggs in the spring. So controlling slugs now at one of the, one of the interstitial seasons um, can give you a fairly good res result in the spring in particular. Uh, slug control is essential any place you're going to be growing winter crops, winter cauliflower, winter leaf crops, um, and is beneficial even in areas that you're just cover cropping and mulching. Don't get carried away, but getting a good dose of, of, a, of a slug control out there uh, can really reduce your ongoing problems for next spring. Most of our winter crops are quite hardy. There are exceptions. Cauliflower is one of those exceptions. Winter cauliflower and overwintered for spring harvest cauliflower usually need some degree of winter protection here and fall is the time to get that in place and ready to apply. This can be very light. I usually just use a, a, a reme fabric, a spun, uh, a spun fabric material to provide just a few degrees of insulation. The plants themselves are perfectly hardy. It's the part you want, the flower bud that gets damaged when the temperatures drop below about 20 degrees. And we do most winters at some point. 
so providing just a little couple of degrees of, of extra insulation from, uh, from a, a, a woven fabric is usually enough to keep them healthy. Uh, many greens crops can be grown for fall into winter harvest or can be planted now for spring harvest. There's the, the cycle in there of late fall through the winter leaf crops that may need some protection to keep them growing fast enough to be worthwhile as a winter crop. Um, so this is true of things like spinach or lettuce, if you're gonna try to winter them over. Um, doing a cover on them will enable you to actually have some winter harvest as well as going them through the, through the winter to spring. Um, on the other hand, things like kale and chard are hardy enough. They really don't need it. You'll get your harvest in the slowing down quite a bit over the winter and then a big push again in the spring, but don't really need the protection. So understand what your crops are out there, what their actual temperature thresholds are and whether those temperature thresholds are survival or rapidity of growing and, uh, and cover as needed appropriately. So that's kind of an overview of your fall in your, in, your, in your lawn, your orchard, your garden, and your landscape. And I would invite anybody who would like to, to unmute and ask questions verbally or continue typing and chat, whatever you're comfortable with. All right. Well, I will let everybody go for the day at this point. And uh, you guys know where to find me here at Chenard's if you have any follow-up questions or, with, or any other gardening tips. Thank you very much.